Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Today I want to talk about the cubic curve. This is a very, very interesting curve in mathematics because it turns out that it happens to have a st the structure of a group. And what I want to do in this video today is to show you how this group structure actually comes from the Picard group structure. Okay, so let's see our uh, setup that we have for today. Okay, we're going to consider um, the following homogeneous form inside KXYZ. It's going to be homogeneous of degree 3 because we're looking at cubic curves here. Okay, so uh, we look at the set of zeros of this homogeneous degree 3 form, F, so we'll call that C. Uh, that's something that's inside the projective plane here, the coordinates uh, x, y, z. So I've drawn it here like this. This is not the usual way that you draw a cubic curve inside the projective plane, but it's a little bit easier for me to draw the associated lines uh, with it. Okay, so we want to study this and we want to show how a group structure naturally arises on this uh, cubic curve here. And for that we need a little fact. Uh, it's not absolutely necessary, but it's the usual way we set this, uh, things up here. And uh, what we're going to do is we first claim that there exists an inflection point on this curve here. Okay, so I won't go through the proof of why this is true, but basically you can compute the condition for this to have an inflection point. Okay, it turns out to be that uh, that's the solution to some sort of cubic equation. And so when you intersect that uh, cubic uh, with this cubic here, you'll get actually nine points of inflection. So there are actually nine points of inflection on this cubic curve here. Okay, so let's just pick one of these inflection points, P0, so that's our P0 here. And uh, it has an inflection line, which I've drawn by this horizontal blue line here, and I've called it L0. Okay, so it's a, an inflection line. Okay, so what's that mean? So it means that this line here, remember any line uh, should intersect the cubic in three points with multiplicity. And in fact, all those three points now have coincided into this one inflection point here, P0. Okay, so that's what I mean by an inflection point. Okay, so let's make uh, three very, very interesting observations here. So now let's pass a different line through this cubic. Okay, so I've got this diagonal L here. And it would intersect in three points, P1, P2, P3, at least if you include multiplicity. So it may be that uh, these two points kind of coincide when you have a tangent. And of course, when all three of them are uh, tangent, uh, uh, when there's an inflection point, all the three will coincide. So that's at another inflection point. Okay, so let's pick one such line, L, that's inside this projective plane P2. And let's call these three points P1, P2, and P3. P1, P2, and P3 here. So that's the first in, uh, observation. The second observation, and this is where the Picard group structure comes in, um, is let's actually uh, uh, look at these lines. So they're given by linear forms. Okay, so let's call the line uh, L0. There's a linear form, little L0, uh, that's inside here. Uh, that gives you the zeros of this L0 will give you this inflection line and the zeros of this L here uh, that's another linear form will give you the other line okay so you just pick these they're defined up to uh, a scalar multiple okay so what happens here and this is the key point okay is that if you look at the ratio between these two this defines a rational function on this projective plane so we can talk about the divisors of that. Okay, and the divisors, of course, well, to work out the zeros, the zeros will be the zeros of L. So you look at the zeros of L, and of course that's given by P1 plus P2 plus P3. And then the poles, where are the poles of this? So the poles will be uh, where you've divided by this L0, they're along here. And so you've got a triple pole at this inflection point P0. Okay, so that means that when you look at the divisor of L over L0, you'll have P1 plus P2 plus P3 minus 3 times P0, okay? And the way I'm going to write this out is I'm going to distribute this P0 over each of these three points. So I'm going to write this up as the sum of PI minus P0. And the sum here, perhaps I should have written that down. The sum will go from I equals 1 up to 3, okay? So this is what you have. And the point is that because this is a divisor of a rational function, this is actually a principal divisor. So this is linearly equivalent to 0 that's going to be absolutely clear, uh, um, important in this uh, game. Okay, so let's just look at a very, very special case of what's going on here. So you want to think of it as the sum of these three um, differences is equal to zero. Uh, let's suppose uh, now we make this line be such that the P2 now coincides with this P0. So it goes through there. Okay, if P2 equals zero, what happens? Well, then you'll have P2 equals P0. That's one of the middle term inside here. That will give you zero. 
So that will tell you that uh, the sum of the remaining terms, p1 minus p0, and p3 minus p0 is actually um, linearly equivalent to zero. So they're negatives of each other inside this divisor class group. Okay, so now uh, we can move on to something called the Jacobian. So uh, what can I tell you about the Jacobian? So let's firstly define this. So what is the Jacobian of this cubic curve? And this is a definition that you can use for any smooth curve. Uh, by the way, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I should emphasize this curve should be smooth. Okay, um, so if you have a generic uh, cubic form, a generic homogeneous degree three form, then this will be smooth. And the reason why we need smoothness is that we want to make sure that we can talk nicely about divisors. Okay, and remember that requires normality, and for curves, normality co coincides with the notion of being smooth. Okay, so here's the Jacobian. What's the definition of this? Uh, this uh, definition makes sense for any smooth projective curve. Uh, the Jacobian of C is going to be an abelian group, and it's going to be a subgroup of the Picard group of C. And all it is, it's just a kernel of the degree map from the Picard group of C to Z. So remember, you can talk about the kernel of this map. Then you have uh, this degree map, which basically means that, well, if you pick a uh, divisor that gives you uh, this line bundle, uh, so it's a linear combination of points, and then just summing the coefficients will give you the degree of that divisor and also of the corresponding uh, invertible sheet or line bundle. This is a group homomorphism, so you can talk about the kernel of that, and that's going to give you the Jacobian. So this is going to be a group. And here's the big theorem, which really makes everything work here. Okay, the theorem is the following. Suppose you have to consider the following map. You're going to go from the cubic curve, this cubic curve here, and I'm going to map it over to this Jacobian. Okay, so what's that going to be? So if you have a point P on this cubic curve, you can send it to P minus P0, so that's a divisor and it's degree 0 because when you sum up the coefficients it's 1 minus 1 is 0. And you look at the corresponding invertible sheet or line bundle, and that's what you have here. And the point is that this is actually bijective. Okay? And this is a really wonderful theorem for two reasons. Okay? You use it uh, uh, in two ways, one to give you more information about C and one to give you more information about G of J of C. So firstly, this C is an algebraic variety, it's an affine variety, so it has geometry associated with it. Okay? This J of C at the moment is just a group. So since it's a bijection, you can say, well, that means that I can use the geometry here and just use this map to say, well, let's just put that geometry, that it will induce a geometry on J of C. So this Jacobian, it's not usually called a Jacobian group, it's actually usually called the Jacobian variety because it has the structure of a variety. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point, and that comes uh, back to what I, how I motivated this video here, is um, the group law on the cubic curve. You see, at the moment, this is just an, a, um, a projective variety. Okay? It just has geometry. It has no extra group structure to it. But this is a group structure. But since this is a bijection, you can pull back the group structure here onto here, and that will give you an uh, actual um, group uh, structure. Okay? And in fact, you can use, it's quite computable what this is. So you can actually compute what the group structure here is quite easily. And maybe I'll tell you about that at the end. Um, so what I want to do here is I just want to tell you briefly how this works, because it's a lovely proof, and it shows how very naturally you can induce the group structure on this cubic curve. Okay, so why does it work? The way we'll do this is we'll work instead of uh, with these, uh, this uh, Jacobian and the Picard group, I'm going to look at the class group. Okay, so the class group is just the divisor version. So you're just looking at the group of divisors, modulo the group of principal divisors here. Okay, so remember this is isomorphic to the Picard group. Um, you just use this uh, O here okay, to get that um, isomorphism. Okay, so let's uh, do the first thing. So let's look at the image of this map phi. Okay, so, um, or actually what you have inside this class group. So you're looking at all the divisor classes, linear equivalence classes, of things of the form P minus P0. That's essentially the image of this when you identify this J of C with um, its I image inside this class group here. Okay, so you're looking at the, all the linear equivalence classes of this P minus P0. Okay, so I claim first that, that this is a subgroup of uh, J of C, of this uh, Jacobian. Okay, so certainly, all of these have degree zero, so this lands inside here, and it's actually closed under uh, addition 
and closed under negation. And okay, this follows just by the two observations that we have here. Okay, let's check closed under negation. Okay, if you have something like this, P minus P0, so that's like this P1, uh, P3 minus P0 here. If you pick P equals P3, well, that's, what's the negative of that? Well, the negative of that is linear equivalent to P1 minus P0. So that gives you its negative also is something of this form. Remember, this is the linear equivalence class. What happens if you want to add two things? Well, remember the sum of three of these things is linear equivalent to uh, zero if you have this sort of form. So if you pick P1 and P2 to be two uh, elements that you want to kind of add together, this P1 minus P0, you want to add that to P2 minus P0. Okay, what you will find is that's the negative of P3 minus P0, where P3 is like this. Okay, so, uh, so since this is closed under negation, that tells you that this is actually closed under addition as well. And hence you've checked the, uh, uh, the fact that this is actually a subgroup of JFC. So that's rather nice. And of course, it, that means that uh, this uh, subgroup is also the group generated by these. Okay, so now what do we want to do? We want to show that this is a bijection, so we need to show that this map is both surjective and injective. Let's check surjectivity first. Okay, so to check uh, surjectivity, uh, let's just pick any element inside this Jacobian. Okay, and we're thinking of it in terms of the divisors. So let's pick a divisor D, okay, which is given by this linear combination of points PI. So to be uh, representing some element of JFC, okay, uh, what do you need here? Uh, you need the degree to be zero, so that just means the sum of the coefficients, sum of NI is equal to zero. Okay, so that's what we have. And we want to show that this is actually an element of this form. Okay. Now remember, this is an actual subgroup, so you can just say that it's a linear combination of something of this form, and you're done. Let's just see how that works. So this D, okay, it's this sum of NI, PI. And what we're going to do is that we're going to throw in a zero term. Since the sum of the NIs is equal to zero, you can subtract NI times P0. And the reason why you do that is that then you have this common NI here. You can pull that out, so you can rewrite this as the sum of NI times PI minus P0. Okay. Now this, each of these PI minus P0, okay, they're give, going to give you something inside this J prime. And since this is a subgroup, this linear combination of them, this integer linear combination of them, is also inside J prime. So that means that this D is inside J prime. And since this was an arbitrary element inside the Jacobian, um, or at least uh, represents an arbitrary element inside the Jacobian, that means that this J prime essentially equals this uh, J of C here. Okay, so that's really, really nice. Okay, the fact that uh, now we have surjectivity of this map. And the only thing that you need to do now is to work out, well, what is the, um, uh, what is the, uh, why is it injective? So let's have a look and see why this map phi is injective. And this requires a different argument now. So suppose two points get mapped to the same place. So in other words, if you have two points here, P and Q, P and Q, you map it over here, we're working with a divisor, so we're just looking at P minus Q, P zero, and Q minus P zero. And to, for them to represent the same, um, uh, give the same invertible sheaf, just means that these are linearly equivalent. Okay? So of course we can add P0 to both sides and then subtract Q. So that just means that P minus Q is linearly equivalent to zero. Okay? So what does it mean for a, a divisor to be linearly equivalent to zero? That just means it's a principal divisor. So that means that we can actually find F, which is some rational function on C, and the divisor of this is precisely P minus Q. So that means that it has a single zero at P, okay? And the minus Q means that it has a single polar Q. And everywhere else, it's going to be a um, non-zero uh, regular sort of uh, regular function. Okay, so that's great. Uh, and what does that mean? So remember, you have a rational function. So that's essentially a map to um, the affine line uh, but it can have poles, so you can also map to infinity. So that basically, that F essentially gives you a map from C to P1. And what can you say about this map? This map from C to P1, okay, it's actually just uh, do a, a degree one map. So this part involves some theory of maps of curves, okay? It's a degree one map because it has a single zero at P and a single pole at Q. So it maps, the only thing that gets mapped to zero in here only point that gets mapped to zero is P, and the only point that gets mapped to infinity is at Q. 
So that tells you that it's a degree one map, and it's, there's, these are smooth curves, so that actually tells you it's an isomorphism. So if your algebraic geometry is good, this is something that you can uh, work out. Okay, and the final part of this, and I won't be able to complete the proof of this, although I will give a video later which shows you why this sort of thing ought to be true, is that this cubic curve here is actually uh, not isomorphic to P1. So that's um, going to be a contradiction unless P and Q are actually the same point. Okay, if P and Q are the same point, then you've got zero is linear to zero, so you can't find this F. Okay, so the last point is just to realize that C is not isomorphic to P1. And there are lots of ways to sh show this. I hope you can kind of see from the picture that it doesn't look like P1. Okay, but so the easiest way to show that this is not true is to invoke the, um, the uh, genus of this C here. So there are various ways to show that this C is not isomorphic to uh, uh, P1. If you work over the complex numbers, you can actually do it topologically. This will be a genus 1, so it will be actually a torus. Okay. Um, but you can also use something called the canonical sheaf, and that's something that we'll talk about later because it's a very, very important part of uh, algebraic geometry. Okay, so that completes the proof of this theorem and shows you that you have this bijection here, and it means that the group structure you can put, put on the Jacobian, which uh, arises naturally, you can now put on this cubic curve. So the thing that you might want to do is to say, okay, so what is this group structure on this cubic curve here? Okay, what is it? So let's just see what happens here. So the key point is that um, uh, is this one here. Okay. If you have P1 minus P0 plus P2 minus P0 plus P3 minus P0, you get um, uh, 0. It's a linear equivalent to 0. So that essentially means that the sum of P1 plus P2 plus P3 is equal to 0 in this group. So if you want to add P1 and P2 together, what you do is you just draw a line through P1 and P2. Okay. And then the answer will be, it'll be the negative of what's given by P3. How do you work out the negative? Well, that's when you use this bit here. So what you do is you draw a line through P3, P0, and then the negative will be over here. And that actually gives you another way to define the group law um, uh, geometrically, okay, which is rather nice. But the thing is, if you just define it that way, so you can define it this way, but it actually takes quite a lot of work to show that this addition is associative. Okay, and here, the way it's set up like this, associativity comes for free because the group structure now is induced from the group structure inside the card group and hence the Jacobian. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.